Twilight Town is the best hub world to exist. I've been a Kingdom Hearts fan my entire life and Twilight Town has always felt like a second home. It's weird to describe a video game location as a place that feels familiar enough to be lived in, but I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way. Exploring the floors of Peach's Castle in Super Mario 64 or the House of Hades, these places are visited the most throughout the game. In the case of Twilight Town, it's not really a hub in the sense that all the other levels are accessed through it, but it's the area that the story constantly comes back to. In the Kingdom Hearts series, there are currently three different types of planes of existence. There's the Realm of Light, where all the Disney worlds can be found. There's the Realm of Darkness, where those who lose their hearts to darkness end up. Then there's the Realm in Between, which currently consists of five different worlds. The Land of Departure, Castle Oblivion, Traverse Town, The World That Never Was, and Twilight Town. I'm not really going to talk about the Quadratum one just yet. We'll get into that later. While Traverse Town is also a special hub world, I want to save that one for another video, but Twilight Town is the one I want to focus on today. For years, Twilight Town has felt the most familiar. From the music to the sunset atmosphere, there's just a coziness about this world. Like, I would want nothing more than to just grab a cup of coffee and just sit in the neighborhood. But I imagine there are tons of other reasons why people love this world as well. Let's start from the beginning. As Twilight Town made its debut in Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, while the entire premise of this game was to revisit old worlds through Sora's memories, Twilight Town is the only world that Sora has never been to. He even mentions how weird it is for him to be here. At this point in the story, even we the player are as confused as what's going on. We don't know this location, and it definitely didn't appear in Kingdom Hearts 1. Maybe it's a transformed version of Deep Jungle, since that place didn't appear in this game either. <laughs> Imagine. Sora swears that he feels like he's been here before, even though we've seen all the worlds he's visited since he left the island. Now we know it's because of his connection with Roxas, a character that hasn't even appeared yet at this point. All the love, pain, power, and adoration that comes with Roxas was foreshadowed in this very moment. Roxas only makes an appearance at the end credits of this game. We knew nothing, but that's what makes these revisits so powerful. The entire area is shrouded in mystery through Chain of Memories, and we are never giving a definitive answer until the next game. This is even the location where most of the boss battles are incredibly important to the story, where Sora battles Vexen in front of the mansion, this just looked like a spooky place with a really cool background, then we later find out that this is the birthplace of all nobodies. Funny enough, it's also exactly where we see one of the most brutal kills in the series. But now you can be nothing instead of just being a nobody. You're off the hook. No! Please don't! I don't want to- Goodbye. Are you people? Sora's just a silly kid who just saw a grown man burst into flames right before his eyes. And I think this moment really sets the tone for Kingdom Hearts moving forward. Like sure, Sora has smoked some people here and there, but to see a member of the organization beg for his life at the exact location of his birth, and we see moments like this happen throughout the series moving forward. Like what? That's so cool. At the end of Chain of Memory, Sora ends up sleeping in a pod for an entire year. While he's taking his nap in Twilight Town, his friends are endlessly working to help wake him up. Jumping into Kingdom Hearts 2, I know a lot of people are fairly divisive about the prologue of this game. People either love it or hate it, and I can totally see both sides of the argument. When I was a kid, Kingdom Hearts 2 was my second game in the series. Mind you, I was maybe 10 or 11 years old at this time. With Chain of Memories being my first game in the series, I actually never beat it back then. The game was too hard for my childlike mind, and because of that, I never got to experience Roxas appearing at the end of the game. I went into Kingdom Hearts 2 not knowing anything about Roxas and not even knowing what he looks like. Funny enough, I feel like a lot of people can relate to this experience with Kingdom Hearts 2 being their first game. And when I booted up Kingdom Hearts 2 for the first time, I was so confused. Like they gave us this cool J-pop opening with the best visuals on the PlayStation 2. Then we start this game as a character who isn't Sora. I was so confused about why I wasn't playing as Sora. There was no Donald and Goofy either. I honestly thought for a second I picked up the wrong game. This is not what I saw in the commercials. It was super slow and kept on introducing new characters that I didn't know about. Kingdom Hearts 1 moments would appear in cutscenes and I just had no idea what was happening. The prologue itself took about two hours to get through, meaning two hours for me to play as the character I bought the game for. I couldn't wait to get to him and this Roxas character was just getting in the way. And now that I'm older and have finished Kingdom Hearts 2 and know everything I do about Roxas, this prologue right here is one of the best in all of gaming history because it is the perfect buildup for what's to come. It is a look at what a normal life would be for a teenager in the Kingdom Hearts universe. Last time we got something like this was at the very beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1 as Sora. When the player is sent to run around the island to collect various items for the raft, it might just seem like another fetch quest, but it gives us a tour of the island. This is his home, where all of his friends and his family reside. And within this next hour, he's about to lose all of it without a single trace. From that moment on, Sora is on a constant quest to reunite with his lost friends and return turn to what he had in the beginning of Kingdom Hearts 1. He just wants to go back to the islands with Riku and Kairi, and that remains his motive for several entries in the series. In the case of Roxas, there was no build up to anything. It's not like Roxas was trying to build a raft to leave the world or anything. He's just a normal kid, having fun with his friends on their final day of their summer vacation, which is something we can all think fondly back on. He and his friend get jobs, solve neighborhood problems, and spend their final days together. Mind you, when we boot up the game, we don't know 
about any of the impending Doom coming. I remember completing the prologue for Kingdom Hearts 2, wondering what happens to Roxas. The cutscene kind of leaves it up in the air at this point. The game just starts with Sora as if the adventure with Roxas never happened. Later finding out that Roxas needed to return to Sora in order for him to wake up, our hero from the last title is essentially being held hostage by this kid who wants to just hang out with his homies, and I think that's one of the most messed up things about it. But there are so many little moments that are sprinkled into the prologue. All the cutscenes where Axel are trying to plea, saying Roxas is his best friend. I remember being like, this guy is crazy and he's trying to set us on fire. I don't believe him. And now I know Axel is the ultimate ride or die. The ultimate ride or die. Also this. Simply amazing, Roxas. Axel. You really do remember me this time. I'm so flattered! But you're too late! The prologue for Kingdom Hearts 2 is a masterclass in foreshadowing. It gives enough mystery to keep the player moving forward while also giving us a slice of life adventure in Kingdom Hearts. Can we talk about how stressed all of these children are? I think about Aqua and Ventus as they were saved in Kingdom Hearts 3 only for them to immediately be thrown into a war that determines the lives of billions. Can you imagine being those characters? Can they take a bath first? Like Jesus. Point is the prologue gives us a moment to chill. We need to be reminded what we're fighting for. And then there's the music and it does this really cool thing. When playing Twilight Town as Roxas, his overworld theme is Lazy Afternoons and the battle theme is Sinister sundown. Although when the player takes control of Sora, the overworld theme changes to afternoon streets and the battle into working together. And it's the only world to do this in this entire game. Although everyone knows Lazy Afternoons is the main theme for Twilight Town. That is Roxas' home and it will remain that way. I just really like that small detail. Then there's something so vital about Twilight Town that is missing from the rest of the series. Arguably the most important point and the thesis of this video, the skateboard. Kingdom Hearts fans immediately got goosebumps hearing that one. I don't know who on the development team who was in charge of making this, but thank you. In Twilight Town is both Sora and Roxas, the player can ride around on a skateboard. It's possible to do neat tricks and it goes super fast. Roxas and Sora even have their own unique skateboards. The controls have no right to being this fluid and tight. And it's not even used for anything outside of a small mini game. The game just leaves it on the floor for you to just pick up whenever you want to. Maybe they put this in the world in order to make it easier to go around since it's so big. Twilight Town in Kingdom Hearts 2 is pretty large, so that would make sense. But I know I would just spend hours trying to do tricks around the town. This was my Tony Hawk Pro Skater growing up. And this was just put here for fun. For fun! This mechanic is well too designed just to be here like this. Yo, I would love for them to make a full-on Kingdom Hearts skating game like this. But of course, I gotta talk about the struggle. And now I don't mean the financial struggles of making these videos, but the town celebration of beating the heck out of each other with rubber bats. Twilight Town has a tradition they follow and everyone in the area loves to lose their minds for it. Sports have always been an excellent way to bring people together. The classic, my guy is better than your guy debate. In Kingdom Hearts 2, it's just another fun thing to do that makes the world feel much more lived in. Roxas is a neighboring kid who wants to be the best and even be up his best friend. There's so much drama and tea in this prologue for it. Like, why are there so many Final Fantasy characters just ready to go? I love how later in the game you're able to participate in struggle as Sora. Like, c come on, this isn't fair. How could I lose? And of course, how can I make a video talking about Twilight Town without talking about its most important and iconic location, the Clock Tower? While it's used in Kingdom Hearts 2 and a few cutscenes with the Twilight Town kids, it really shines in 358 over two days. This entire entry is focused on Roxas' life during his time in the organization. He's got a 9 to 5 job where he spends a lot of his time downing ice cream with his homies. And that happens right at the top of this tower. After every mission, we can count on these three chowing down some sea salt ice cream, which is so cute. Then it becomes a location when Roxas and Shion have a fight to the death, as both need to return to Sora in order for him to wake up. The final battle of days is where we be chilling, and now we be killing. It's so crazy. Like, how did they get away with it. Also small tangent, but I do really like the final boss for days because of how it uses the Disney World. I do think the Disney World should appear more in the final battles. It's just very thematically pleasing. It's just cool to go to places that you've been previously throughout the game. With that being said, Twilight Town has always been that place to be. Then Kingdom Hearts 3 came out. Wait, 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 let me explain. At the start of Kingdom Hearts 3, Sora, Donald, and Goofy return to Twilight Town to search for important information on how to bring back Roxas. The game starts off super strong because they're mentioning a character as important as Roxas so early on. It seems the game is going to build on this plot thread. But no, they don't. Okay, okay, okay. Let me start talking about the good before I lose my mind. Twilight Town in Kingdom Hearts 3 looks fantastic. This world looks exactly like what a big budget Kingdom Hearts game looks like to me. There are tons of NPCs running around the neighborhood, each with their own lines and quotes. They might even mention an old reference to Twilight Town from an older game. I like how there's this entire movie theater section in the area that used to be completely empty. I can't imagine how they would make this world look any visually better. Then there's the addition of Remy and the Bistro. Of course, Ratatouille is one of the best Pixar movies out there, and this was the Kingdom Hearts game to introduce Pixar into the 
mix. We got Toy Story and Monsters Inc. as dedicated worlds, but then they did something creative with Remy. Instead of dedicating an entire world to him, let's add him to Twilight Town to show off one of the game's biggest new mechanics. As Sora explores the world, he'll occasionally find some ingredients which he could use to make some dishes. Remy will then take control of Sora and will make him be the cook, just like in the movie. Remy doesn't even speak in this, which makes it even funnier. The Bistro is a pretty bump in location, and collecting and perfecting every dish is part of the challenge. The Bistro is also run by Uncle Scrooge, who is continuing his hustle around the cosmos. The buffs given from these dishes can make the difference between a win or a loss for certain boss battles. This is just a nice area that adds more context to Twilight Town. Then of course, there's the legendary hater kick. Can I talk about how brave this is? Ansem can destroy this man in a second, but he doesn't care because it's the right thing to do. It's one of the most iconic moments in the game. And that's what I really loved about Twilight Town and Kingdom Hearts 3. But I gotta be fair and just speak from the heart. This world feels a lot smaller in scale than the original, which isn't how it should feel. While it's super neat that it's possible to physically walk from the neighborhood into the sewers, through the forest, and to the mansion, the scale of the world feels so much smaller because a lot of Twilight Town's key locations are missing. The two biggest offenders of this being the Sandlot and the Clock Tower. I think it's fine that other locations like Sunset Terrace or the Underground Corridors didn't make a return since these were fairly cut off from the surface areas. Missing the Clock Tower and the Sandlot though? That ain't it. These two areas are important for narrative reasons and made Twilight Town feel like a real place to be. And this was the first time this world was seen in this graphical engine. It's so nice to revisit places that were previously available and see how they changed. The thing is, you can still see them in the background, but you physically can't go to them. That's such a tease since it's foreboding in the back the entire time. I think just allowing the player to walk down the street to these areas would have been sufficient. It adds to the game feel that makes this world feel much more complete. Knowing that there are areas that I can't access that are super important in Kingdom Hearts is just a bummer. Twilight Town is a place where some of the most tragic and important moments happen. And this is the game that offers you the chance to take selfies, but I can't go on the top of the clock tower? That's such a tease. Unfortunately, the modding community has made it possible to explore these areas. The clock tower is even fully textured and has collisions, making it possible to stand on. Maybe they had plans to use this area in development, but changed their mind midway through. I do wish the actual games had access to it, but honestly, we're moving into an entirely new area for Kingdom Hearts. I think Twilight Town has played its part, and I don't think we're going to be seeing it anytime soon. Kingdom Hearts 4 seems to be focused on Sora and this brand new reality that he's in. Because of that, I don't think Twilight Town will appear. Quadratum will likely be the hub for this Kingdom Hearts entry, and I do hope they go above and beyond. I'd like to see a city where Sora can take on jobs, interact with its residents, hang out, and just do normal teenager things. I do hope it can feel like a second home for Sora like Twilight Town was a second home for us. Kingdom Hearts does not give us enough downtime with its characters, and I do think this entry has the potential to knock it out of the park. Just a moment to breathe so we can remember what Sora is fighting for. Twilight Town showed me how important a good hub world can be and how it should feel familiar to be successful. It's the best hub world in the series, and I do hope Quadratum could top it. But, of course, what do you guys think? I know a lot of people have opinions on Kingdom Hearts 3's Twilight Town, so like, let me know in the comments. I love reading the tea. Do you like it? Do you feel it could have been better? Was there something missing for you? Thank you all so much for watching. Please be sure to comment, like, subscribe, and stay awesome.